All right. Sounds good. Okay, so we only have an hour today and we've got a lot to go over. So I'm just gonna start now. Um, and again, if you're just joining us, if you want to just introduce yourself in the chat, um, you can give us your name and where you're from and anything else. And as Sarah just reminded everyone, make sure you change it to sending your chats to everyone um, when you do that. Um, yeah, so again, welcome to Dencho's Family History and Genealogy Workshop for Tadima 2023. We're happy you could be here on a Sunday to talk a little bit more about genealogy and Japanese American genealogy in particular. Um, let's see. Just to start off, I just want to give you a brief overview of how the workshop's going to go today. We're going to just do introductions, and then I have set this up in a you do your genealogy in four steps, which is simplifying things, but we don't have a lot of time, and I will go through them each as we um, hit them. At the end, I have just a genealogy tip slide, and then we're going to try and save the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so any questions you have, feel free to put them in the Q&A section of the um uh, webinar. And yeah, if we don't get to your questions uh, in the 15 minutes that we have left, uh, we will try and get everybody's questions answered. So if you are, as long as your question is next to your name, we should be able to email you back at some point. All right, so I'm just going to, we're going to do quick introductions and then I'll go over a little bit more housekeeping. But for those of you who don't know, I just wanted to mention a little bit about Densho as an organization. Uh, we've been around for like 28 years now, and our mission is to preserve and share the history of World War II incarceration. And um, our main offering is uh, an online archive and a public history organization. And so we have a lot of oral histories and materials related to the Japanese American incarceration. And I'll talk more about how Densho can help you in your genealogy research as we get down to the research section of the presentation today. And then we, the three of us, are all gonna do quick introductions. Um, I am Caitlin Oyakun. I'm the archives director at Densho. I've been here for about 12 years and I manage um, the archives team, the oral history project, and our family history program. Uh, and so I will be giving the presentation today, uh, and I'll pass it off to Micah to talk about who she is and what she's going to be doing. Hi, everybody. My name is Micah Merriman. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the assistant archivist at Densho. I've been involved with Densho for about seven years now in various roles. Um, I will be uh, moderating the chat and also running the Q&A with Caitlin at the end. So please make sure that you put your questions in the Q&A section and not in the chat, because if they end up in the chat, I might we might not be able to weed back through it and find everything, so. Yeah, and then Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Beckman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the digital archivist at um, Dinsho. I've been with Dinsho around eight years now in various roles. Um, I'm running uh, everything behind the scenes, the recording, your polls, and um, I will be sending out your post-webinar emails uh, tomorrow. So hi, everyone. Yeah. And uh, so that post-webinar email you'll get, I do want to let you know. So this is being recorded. And as long as you registered for the event, you will get an email with a link to the recording so you can watch it again. And also, we are going to send out a PDF of the PowerPoint. So that will be in the same email, and you don't need to worry about taking screenshots today or writing down what's on the screen because you will get that um, the PowerPoint slides uh, that you can reference later on. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, yeah, and we're going to start off with a poll. So Sarah's going to put a poll up on the screen. It's really quick and easy. It just gives me kind of a gauge as to where we're at. So <clears throat> just kind of want to know like where you're at in your genealogy journey. And it might not be like accurate to one of these, but just pick the one that's like closest to where you feel like you're at right now. We'll just give it like a minute or so, see where we're at. This is fun. I get like a real time uh, real-time responses here. 
looks like most of you are at least familiar with genealogy and some of you have been doing it for quite a long time. Uh, all right, let's I'll end the poll now and share the results. So looks like it's about 50-50 almost. People have been working on it for years and I feel pretty experienced and some who are kind of maybe in the beginning stages, but know what it is. Uh, so yeah, hopefully by the end, you know, I'll have been able to share things that help you out in what you're doing right now, whether you are a beginner or super experienced. So again, like I said at the beginning, genealogy is this really huge topic. Um, I know professional genealogists who've been doing it for decades who still do um, classes and workshops like constantly like throughout the years because there's always like more to learn. So I'm going to try and hit just kind of high level points for this and it's going to be more from my perspective as what I have found in doing genealogy. I started doing it when I was in high school based off of my um, grandparents who were incarcerated at Tule Lake that kind of really got me interested in like learning about the history of my family and what happened there. And in recent years, it's just really kind of exploded with access to all of the online tools like Ancestry and Family Search and even digital archives uh, around the country. There's so much more that you can access online from your homes rather than having to say, go to an archives and actually, you know, flip through the files. Um, and I thought maybe the way I would do this today is I am going to give you these steps and I'm going to kind of use my own family research as an example of how I went through these steps and how I worked with my own family history. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful um, just to give you kind of some examples uh, of my research and how you might apply it to yours. So with that being said, let's go on. So when I think about genealogy and how you do it, and some of you may have already started this, I feel like the first step is to gather all of the information that you already have. So not just you and your immediate family, but you know your extended family. A lot of us have tons of cousins and aunts and uncles, and even like family friends who were close to your relatives, um, you know, in the 40s and during like earlier than that and during immigration. So reach out and ask people, just ask them questions. What do they have? You know, send an email. Um, my family hosted a little kind of very small mini family reunion that was specifically to talk about like, oh, we have this photo album or um, my great uncle wrote up a little like family history bio that they shared at that reunion. And it was nice for everybody to get together and just kind of talk. And so when you're gathering this content, what I look for and what, you know, most people will are like the photos, personal letters, any sort of documents that have been kept over time, heirlooms, so physical objects. Um, a lot of people already have family trees, some that have been written out by hand on just like a printout. Uh, oral histories that you may have recorded with your family members or, you know, your own written family stories that haven't been published, but they just kind of live within your family's history. Then just to give you some examples. So this is from my own family, the Oya family. Um, the photo is of um, the photo on the left is my grandmother's wedding OB. Um, there's an example of a postcard that got sent and a photograph from Japan. And these I was all able to collect um, before even starting to do research outside of my family's like personal archives. But then what I also learned was that one of my cousins had donated his side of the family's materials to the Washington State Historical Society back in like 2016. And so this image over here is of um, some of the physical objects that you can go and look at at the museum. So, you know, it was great to like talk to my cousins and find out that those materials are there because, you know, I can go in and access them at the Washington State Historical Society's Research Center um, and just look at this vast collection of letters that are there. 
So, you know, that's the first step. Some of you may have already done it. Some of you may want to do it now. And it's not just like you do it once and you're done. I think of that as something you can do at any time. But the other thing you should do pretty quickly is step two, which is organize. So it's really great to figure out your organizational system at the beginning, um, rather than having to like go back in and figure it out later. And when I'm talking about organizing, you should think about both your physical materials and your digital materials. So when you think of physical foldering, it's often um, file cabinets with folders in them, and then you put the paper in the folders. But I'm sure a lot of you have extensive collections of either, you know, census copies that you downloaded from Ancestry or um, digitized photographs from your family. And it's really important and it really helps with your genealogy if you create a good system um, so that you can find things and know where they are. And I'll show you an example in just one minute. You also probably wanna decide on the way that you are going to keep your family tree. Um, there's many ways you can do it. Many people do it differently. It just really depends on what works best for you. And along with those, you can do family group sheets, which kind of take one couple and their children and you just kind of record them on a piece of paper. And that just kind of is a nice condensed way to look at that family. And then you also might wanna think of collaborative tools that you could use. So if you're doing this genealogy all on your own and you don't wanna you know, worry about sharing it, that's fine. But if you're working with other family members, um, you know, parents, extended family, that sort of thing, you might wanna look at some collaborative tools you can use to share this content back and forth. And next slide. So just as an example here, um, the two screenshots with the writing on them, this is an example of how I organize my own personal Oya family history or genealogy. The top one that has the little folder icons. Basically what I use is um, Linda Harms Okazaki uh, introduced the, me to this and she has a template of folders that are based on the type of record. So, birth, marriage, and death records, censuses, um, correspondence, that sort of thing. And I just, I have a template of all of these folders. And when I create a new family that I'm working with, I copy all of those folders and put them into a new um, like overarching folder. So it's Oya, and then you have all of the different types of records underneath. And then within those folders, I make sure that I name all of my files in a consistent manner that explains what that file is without having to open it. There's many different ways you can do this and it works, you know, whatever works best for you and how you think should be fine. I like to sort it by date um, so that things are in chronological order. And so I put the date first and then the name of the person that the um, record is related to and then like a brief description of what the record might be. And it's just an easy way for me to look at these files without actually having to open them and know what's in them. And then you can see, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It's just an ancestry tree. So that is just one of many options of ways that you can work with your family trees. And you can always share the ancestry trees out. Um, but yeah, let me move on here. So that was a very brief discussion of organization, but we actually have a full hour-long webinar with Linda Harms Okazaki that talks about organizing your family research. So in that webinar, she goes through more in depth, like that foldering system that I showed you, talking about naming your files, what you can do with them. So I've linked here to the webinar itself, and then also to a um, information sheet that she created. And um, so if you wanna go deeper into organization, um, feel free to check out those, that webinar, read the PDF. You can also look at some other sites 
Cindy's list is a really good resource. Or if you just Google like organizing your genealogy, it will just come up with a million hits um, of what you might uh, look into. In terms of like family tree resources, you know, Ancestry is a really popular one. Unfortunately, you have to pay for it. I've just put some other options out here. They are all usually have some sort of fee related to them. Some are softwares that you can just purchase once and have. Others are a monthly subscription. Um, we at Densho have looked at Roots Magic and I've looked at Family Tree Maker. Um, but you're, if you're interested in um, keeping your family tree in an actual like software, these are just some of the options out there for you. I do also know some people who just keep their family trees uh, in like kind of Word doc form, just themselves. They don't use a software. Uh, it's really up to you and what works best for you. And then with cloud and collaboration, you probably know all of these, you know, already. I don't know why there's a comma between Microsoft and OneDrive. That should be Microsoft OneDrive is an option. iCloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, Box. These are all places that will help with your backup of your materials, but also help you if you want to collaborate. So you can share a, say, Dropbox with your family members, and then you can all access the files within the Dropbox whenever you need to. Um, so yeah, that is a little bit more about organizing. Again, I apologize that this is all very kind of surface level and um, brief, but I'm trying to point you in uh, directions where you can really dive deep into each of these steps as you have time. Um, so step three, research. This is like the big chunk of your genealogy work, I'm assuming. For me personally, I find the research part to be like fun and rewarding and you can just like, there's something about finding that like say birth certificate that you just couldn't find for years and years and all of a sudden you have access to it and you can find it it's really nice but it is also very time consuming and can just send you down these rabbit holes that could take you like hours and hours off track of what you were doing so to make your research more efficient uh so that you can get like the most bang for your buck there's a couple of things that you might want to do. First, focus on your most recent ancestors and work backwards. So I tried to collect as much information as I could about my grandparents because they are, um, you know, the closest to me. I knew them. I have access to a lot of the um, photos and letters that they sent and took. And it's just easier. And then as you work backwards, um, you always you already have kind of like laid that nice bedrock for your future research. The other thing that I learned as I got deeper into genealogy is that it is helpful to have a specific research question in mind. So in my family, the Oyas, if I am looking on ancestry for my great grandfather, Sunetaro Oya, there are actually two people with very similar names who lived in similar places and were born and died at similar times. Uh, one, the last name is spelled O-I-Y-E and the other is spelled O-Y-E. And so my research question was, were these two men the same person or were they different people? And so I did a whole you know, research project of trying to figure out same person, different people. And that was helpful because then I know going forward, in this case, they were actually two different people. Going forward, I know that that is the case. And so it won't trip me up. You can also say work off of a question of who were Sune Taro Oya's parents, that sort of thing. So it kind of condenses your research into manageable bits that you can then build on. And importantly, you always want to keep a research log. I'm sure we're all we all have come across times where we were researching something, didn't find anything, and then forgot about it, 
and then a couple months later came back and ran the exact same searches for the exact same thing and came up with the exact same results. If you kept a research log, you could go back and reference it and say, oh yeah, I searched for this death certificate, but I couldn't find it and here's why I don't think I'll ever be able to access it, that sort of thing. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of research. And what I want to do now is talk more about the types of records that you might want to look for in your Japanese American um, research. So some of these are very specific to the Japanese American experience, and some of them are more broad to the US experience in general. And I broke them down into different sections. And again, I will say this is gonna be brief and very um, kind of surface level discussion, but we do have webinars that go into many of these records in much more depth. So we have a record, a webinar that's an hour long that talks about specifically immigration records, one that talks about Japanese records. Um, and I will, uh, the links to those are um, in a few slides, so you can access those. But we'll start with immigration records. There are, two things that I find really helpful. One is if your ancestor uh, came across and they received an A number, and I believe it was 1940, then you can access their A files, which stands for alien files, which is just a record of many things, uh, whatever has taken place since your ancestor immigrated to the US up until, um, I don't know, it depends on when they, uh, when they, if they left, if they died. So it can cover a lot. Uh, if you're lucky, those files have been moved to the National Archives, NARA, and you can access them there. Uh, if you're not so lucky, they are still with the USCIS, which is much more expensive to retrieve files from there. Uh, and I will say anytime there's a name in parentheses behind a record type it is because that is specifically where you'll find it. If there's nothing mentioned, then you can find a lot of these records like at Ancestry or Family Search or MyHeritage, other online uh, genealogy resources. The other thing that is super important are passenger manifests and border crossings. I find these really helpful with my relatives. Um, they show you they're really good from like 1900 on and it gets a little harder to find them in the 1890s but the passenger manifests can give you so much information about your ancestor including like specifically where they were from in japan some of them even give the address of where their family lived which is going to be very important if you're trying to find koseki which we'll talk about in a minute um so yeah i really recommend looking for those passenger manifests Basic records that just every genealogist is going to be looking for are obviously censuses. Likely you're looking at 1900 through 1950 because the 1890 census burned. Um, and then city directories, if your ancestors lived in cities, these are uh, really good to track them and track where they lived and what businesses they um, were involved in. Uh, I'm gonna skip Koseki for a second, but newspapers, really great, even if you're just learning about what was happening with your ancestors at the time. And then of course your basic birth, marriage and death records. And the Koseki. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you saw our announcement, but Densho is going to be helping with Koseki retrieval and translation now. And hopefully if you did see that, you understand a little more about what a Koseki is. They are the family registers from Japan. And if you can get them for your families, they are a wealth of information. They're basically all US vital records combined into one document for a family that can go back to the mid 1800s. Uh, I was able to request my Oya Koseki and get those from Japan and get them translated. And uh, it is just really, kind of expanded what I can do with my genealogy. And then the big ones for JA genealogy, incarceration records and relocation and redress records. 
So there are a set of records for incarceration that you should definitely try and get. The Form 26 is just the database. So you can go to either the National Archives or if you go to Densho, you can find the data of what your ancestors filled in when they were going into the camps. If you have relatives who were arrested uh, by the FBI or um, yeah, during the, the war, then you would look at the Department of Justice files, which are at NARA. They do have assembly center files for each family, and those are accessible at San Bruno's NARA. The WRA evacuate case files, which might be something that most of you are familiar with, those are any records related to your family member that happened while they were at one of the WRA camps. The final accountability roster entries, which are the exit um, entry, exit logs for all of the camps. Um, and those you can get from many places like Ancestry, Family Search, Densho has copies of them as well. They are really great because they show you where your ancestors went when they left the camps and kind of what sort of um, leave they took. If your ancestor was in the military, you've got the military files at St. Louis. This can be a little difficult because a lot of these burned um, in, I believe it was 1967, but you can try and see what they have. And then I find camp newspapers to be super helpful just in understanding like what was going on with your ancestors when they were incarcerated, the types of things that were happening. Sometimes you will even find um, articles about them in these newspapers. Uh, so it's really great to kind of go through those. For relocation and redress, it's nice because the 1950 census was just released a couple of years ago. And this can help you track where your ancestors went from going into the camps to leaving the camps and then perhaps where they may have stayed. Some people stayed in you know, Chicago, Cincinnati, New York, uh, so the 1950 census will show you a lot. There are redress case files that you can um, request from the National Archives. And then more recently, we've been working at Densho a lot with the local JSO, JACL chapters around the country, and they have a lot of records. So if you know where your ancestors lived, and if you know that they were members of a chapter of a JACL, I definitely recommend getting in touch and seeing if they have anything, because you never know. So some examples from my family, just so that you kind of see what they look like. So on the left, that is the actual copies of the Koseki that came from Yawatahama in uh, on Shikoku for my family. Um, they, you know, they're copies made on, you know, it's like kind of pink paper. So they're not old looking, they're not originals, but the information there is just amazing. Uh, there's an example of a passenger manifest here. This one, it doesn't show my great grandfather, but he's on here. Um, and it shows like where he last lived, when he was last in the US, that sort of thing. And then on the right is from the Tulane Dispatch, which my ancestors were in Tule Lake. And this is actually the birth announcement for my uncle, who was born on October 27th, 1943, I believe. Um, so that was really kind of fun to find that and see my grandparents on there. So again, that was like a really brief overview of all of the different like records that you might find in your Japanese American genealogy research. So I wanted to point you to some resources that can be helpful. This is definitely not exhaustive in any way. I just um, put some of the bigger ones I know about recently here. So finding your Nikkei Roots webinar series is what I've been talking about with Linda Harms Okazaki. We now have 12 webinars. They're usually between an hour and an hour and a half. And the recordings of those are all available um, from that link. We also, again, started our Densho Koseki Retrieval and Translation Services project. You can learn more about that there. That is to help families connect um, with, their, with Japan and try and recover those records. Um, oftentimes the language barrier is just really daunting for us. I know it was daunting for me. And so having help with that was um, 
I don't know how I would have done it without uh, my coworkers' help. So, uh, the National Archives has a full page related to incarceration records that they hold. So, if you visit that link, it goes through the different databases you might look at, indexes, and it points you to areas you might look to find records about your relative. Usually, these are not digitized, and you are going to have to request them from the archivist. But um, you know, they're busy, but they're really responsive and they just, you know, they want to help you find stuff. So I recommend looking there. And then look at Facebook groups. Um, the Japanese American Roots Facebook group is one that's really active. Uh, it was started well, maybe five years ago now. Um, and you can go on there, ask questions, see people's questions, get hints and things like that. I just learned about this one, which is interesting for anybody who has relatives who are in Canada, but the Nikki National Museum uh, has started a service um, where they will talk to you for about an hour, just about any questions you have or how to find things or what type of records to look at up there. And then the Japanese American Evacuation and Resettlement Records I put on here because I don't know as a lot of people know about it, and it's very overwhelming, but the University of California at Berkeley digitized thousands and thousands of records um, related to this project. And you can go to this link and these are all digitized. So you can look at all these materials and it's just so much information about the incarceration. And there's some cases where you might find your ancestor's name in there, or you might found more, find more information about even just the camp, what was going on in the camps, and they might point you in different directions as to where you might go in your research. But again, so many other places, you could always look at the at JANUM, your um, Japanese American Historical Societies where you live, or your cultural centers where you live. Um, there's many people who can help out. And kind of along those lines, I do want to go over Densho's resources and how they can help you in your genealogical research. We've got four main tools that are helpful in this. The large one is the Densho Digital Repository. This is where we hold all of our oral histories and digitized documents. The Names Registry, the Encyclopedia, and Sites of Shame. And I will just talk about each of these. So the DDR is um, we have over a thousand oral histories now that you can access, over a hundred thousand um, digital files like photographs, letters, the camp newspapers, the final accountability rosters, all of that. But even if you can't find your specific relatives in there, it gives you a really good um, way to immerse yourself in what the times may have been like for your ancestors. You know, what was it like living at, say, Heart Mountain, which is this photo here. Um, perhaps your ancestor, like mine, my grandfather worked in the mess hall. So what was it like as a mess hall worker? Were there photos? That sort of thing. And then again, the camp newspapers, you can access all through here. So you can just go to Thule Lake and then be, and then say, I know my uncle was born in October of 43, and then just look through each uh, edition to find him. And then I gave you some tips here on how you can search, uh, but we're always happy to answer questions about the content and how to find things if you need it. So the Names Registry is a continually evolving project that we've been working on for a while now. And it's a database of everyone who was incarcerated during World War II. Each person who was incarcerated has their own unique identifier. So, you know, my grandmother, grandfather, aunt, and uncle are all in this database. And right now, when you search for them, you can find, at, you will access the data for the Form 26, the final accountability roster data, um, and sometimes military databases. But in the future, the very near future, hopefully within the next six months to a year, if I went in and searched for my grandmother, I could find her name and then beneath her name, I would be able to access anywhere that she showed up in the Densho Digital Repository. Um, so it's a work in progress. It's a living project. We're constantly adding to it. Um, 
but it's going to be really great for genealogists when it is fully ready and functional. The encyclopedia, again, you're probably not going to find um, your relatives in the encyclopedia, but it really helps you understand Japanese American history, specifically about the World War II experience, but you know, it covers immigration, relocation and redress, all of that. And understanding the context around the time period that your relatives lived is a really important part of genealogy. If you, I mean, this is a this is an example that nobody here would have, but if for some reason you were researching your Japanese American relatives and you had no idea that the incarceration happened, that's a whole line of records that you would not know that you were supposed to be searching for. So knowing like the global events that are happening at the times your ancestors lived will help you to know what you need to research. And when it comes to writing, which we're gonna talk about next, it allows you to write about their lives in a more like complex and nuanced ways. So a lot of people use the encyclopedia and again, you can get sucked down rabbit holes in there as well. There's so much information. And then Sites of Shame, it's been live for, I think, a year now, our new version of this. And if you haven't been there, I definitely recommend you going. It's like um, a visual mapping tool that we're doing with the uh, camps, actually, all the incarceration sites during World War II. And I haven't put it here because we are about to launch um, something called Manzanar Up Close, I believe and it's an extension of Sites of Shame. So I encourage you to follow Den Show on social media because we will be announcing when Man's in Our Close Up launches. And it's going to be uh, a much, it's similar to Sites of Shame, but it's going to be specifically about Man's in Our, and it's gonna be really cool, so. But just to give you like a visual of what Sites of Shame looks like, these are the different, um, it's interactive, so you can change their views and things like that. But the one on the left, the green lines show you where uh, Japanese Americans were lived before and then where they went to camp. And then the blue lines are where they relocated afterwards. So it gives you like a good visualization of like what happened. I think that looks like Heart Mountain is where I selected. So I picked Heart Mountain and I wanted to see the maps of like who came, where people came from, and then where they left to afterwards. Um, and then we also have a couple of family journeys. So it shows you based off of the family, like where they went and where they came from and the different trajectories of all the places that they went during the war. And again, this is not gonna talk about your ancestors specifically, but it gives you a much better idea visually of what they were going through, the types of people that they lived with when they were in the camps, how far away everything was from each other, how remote things were. Uh, so yeah, I recommend going in there and just kind of, um, you know, searching around and getting like a visual idea of what things were like. So that was the research section. And again, I'm happy to answer questions about specifics, I recommend you go and look at those resources um, to learn more about the research part. But we've got about five minutes left and I really do wanna leave 15 minutes for question and answer. So we are wrapping up with step four, which is I think, I wanna wanna speak for everybody. For me, it's the hardest part. It's the writing and the actual taking of my research and distilling it down into some like final product. So you don't have to think about writing as like sitting down and writing an essay like you're in high school. There's different different ways that you can do it. So it's often the most difficult, but it's really rewarding. You've done like hours and hours and hours of work. You want to be able to share it, right? You want to be able to like talk to your family about it. You want your children to be able to read it and to know what you had done. So I just wanted to list a couple of options just to maybe get you thinking a little outside of the box. You've got your traditionals, right? Like, like a full book. I know people who've written full books about their families. I can only 
hope to one day be able to have time to write a full book about the Oya family. But you've got that, you've got biographies. You could just write up a really quick, like two page biography about one couple in your life. A lot of people I have talked to over the years have created their own photo essay books. Uh, you're probably aware of these. You can go to like places like Shutterfly or any of the um, printing services and you can design your own books. And often there will be a photo and then places for you to write, you know, paragraphs or sentences that kind of talk about the photo or talk about your family's history. And those are a much easier, I think, entry point uh, when you're doing your own genealogical writing. And they're also interesting to look at and, you know, you can buy like five of them and you're done and you're good. So there are those, but you can also do things like blog posts, you know, start your own blog, have a family blog that you write up little posts every, you know, week or month or whatever. You can have your family add to it, that sort of thing. But at least it's written up and it's out and it's shared. Um, social media posts, I think as we are you know, deeper and deeper into the social media, like time. I've seen a lot of people do this with Instagram where you can have a photograph and then the caption is just a little, you know, like couple paragraph, couple sentence blurb about what was happening in that photo. So this photo here is my grandfather, um, Shigenori Oya. And I could say, post this photo on Instagram and just write up a little blurb about it. It was taken in 1939 and where he was at at the time, he was living in Tacoma and he was, you know, doing this type of work, that sort of thing. And some people have their own websites. It's really easy to like create your own website as long as you just pay for the domain and keep it up. Um, yeah, it's um, kind of like a blog post, but can be a little more interactive. And just to show you some examples of what I have done uh, through my own genealogical work. Uh, recently, I wrote a biographical sketch about my great grandfather, which is the one on the left. And it's about, I think it's 13 pages long in Word. Uh, but yeah, it just kind of goes from his birth to his death. And it writes about him and some of the experiences and communities that he was involved in. The image on the right is an article I wrote recently about my mother, my grandmother's wedding obi, which is an heirloom that we hold in my parents' house. And yeah, it just, it's got a different focus. It's about an object, but it also allows me to write about my grandfather, my grandmother and, you know, her life and where, what happened to her um, over the course of, you know, being born in Colorado, moving to Japan, coming back, going to camp, all of that. And then the middle one is just a Densho one. It's not one I wrote specifically, but it's an example of how you could do this in, say, uh, an Instagram post. Something really easy. You know, you've got an image or multiple images and just, you know, a brief few paragraphs about the person in there and their life and what it was like. So just really to wrap it up, here are some tips that I have come up with for myself over the years and what I've learned with genealogy. Some of these we've hit on. So start with your most recent ancestors and build backwards. Expand your research beyond just the people you are looking at, but like the events and the places that they lived. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but don't always rely on other people's public family trees and like family search or ancestry. Those aren't necessarily true. I use them as places to give me clues if I don't have information. It's like, it could give you a name and then you can go research that person and see if you agree. Uh, don't assume things are true without finding proof behind it. Uh, we all have family stories that, um, you know, could be completely true, but memory is a weird thing and it's fluid. And they, you know, when you find the document that proves it, that's when I know that it's actually true. Starting with a specific question, we talked about keeping things safe and organized. And then I haven't mentioned this yet, but I do want to point it out here. You always want to cite your sources. It's really important first to like help you get back to that source. Um, if you find, say, a random 
um, church record in Family Search one day. If you don't cite it somewhere, you might not be able to find it again. But you also want to cite things to point people to the proof of how whatever research question you're researching. Um, and it's also just always good to cite in general to give people credit for their work and what they've done. So again, stay, here's our social media tag and our website. I know I went over a lot of information. So I haven't looked at the q and I don't know what it looks like right now. So Mike is popping on. Yeah, we questions. We've got about 11 questions already, but please feel free to keep adding questions to the Q&A. We'll try and go through them as uh, efficiently as possible. And as Caitlin mentioned at the top of the webinar, if we don't get to your question and you do put your name next to it, we can uh, try and contact you next week and hopefully get you an answer to your question. So uh, your first question, Caitlin, is... What are the advantages and disadvantages of different family tree software? Are there any ones that you recommend over others? Yeah, I mean, to me, well, so I don't know if any of you have used Family Search. I don't recommend that one necessarily because those are editable by anybody who's in Family Search. So, like, my grandma's in there and somebody put incorrect information in her entry. So they're a little, family search is a little strange. Um, I would, the thing I would recommend you do is pick one is the most important thing. So Ancestry is really easy to use. And if you have a subscription, it's nice. It's interactive. Most of my records are there anyway, but if I, you got to make sure you update it because if it doesn't have accurate information in there, if it's all based off of Ancestry's research, that might not flow with what you have. Um, Roots Magic and Family Tree Maker are good, but they are, again, it's a lot of work to, <laughs> to enter stuff. I feel like I'm not totally <laughs> answering this question. I'm giving a lot of caveats. Um, Micah, what do you use? You use Ancestry? Uh, for my personal stuff, I have only used Ancestry, but I'm also not deeply invested in doing my own family genealogy. It's kind of an on and off hobby. Mm -hmm. But if you're deeply invested, you may want to look at doing uh, using an actual software software, but it's mm -hmm. truly about what works best for you and the systems that you're going to create. So yeah. It's kind of a question we can't totally answer, but you should definitely do some research yeah. and find out what works best for you. And I will say all of the softwares like Roots Magic and Family Tree Maker, they have the ability to link to Ancestry and Family Search. So you can do imports and exports and update your information there. So Roots Magic does work really well and Family Tree Maker also works really well if you want to try those out. Yeah. Uh, the next question is um, about uh, Kosekis from Hiroshima. Were those records destroyed? That is a good question that I don't know the specific answer to. So we might need to follow up with you about this. Um, I believe there are still some extant, but I'm sure there are also some that have been destroyed, but we can get in touch with you. I will have my coworker now go see what she can find on it. Um, are passenger manifests also held at USCS and NARA, or are they somewhere else? Passenger manifests are usually the originals or the microfilm originals are all held at NARA. And then NARA sells microfilm publications of them to all of the different genealogy sites. So Ancestry, Family Search, My Heritage, all of that. And it's just easier to go there. There's also on the East Coast a few different places that you would look at. I don't know how many people here are interested in East Coast um, immigration, but they are all held by NARA. It's just not as easy to find them through NARA. Uh, 
what records are available related to the World War II in Hawaii? My grandparents were not in camp, but they were subject to martial law. Yeah, so that there are, the, those would all be with, well, at least the things that were military related would be with the National Archives as well. I know that the JCCH in Hawaii has a project, I'm not sure where they're at on it, where they were going to go to NARA and DC and digitize a bunch of records related to Hawaii. So they are likely scattered throughout. It's hard to explain how National Archives records work. You have to know like what agency was running the program that was like, say, arresting people or doing things. And if you can go back that way, you can find it. Um, but we may follow up with you with more specifics after this webinar. So I can give you a better answer than that. Uh, are Koseki requests expensive? So it really is, it really depends. Um, at Densho, what we're doing is 30 hours of $30 an hour for research and correspondence with the agency and $50 per hour for the Koseki translation. So a page takes Naoko about 30 minutes to translate. So you get two pages for $50. The difficulty comes in is if you already know the address of your family in Japan specifically, and you have the kanji of their surname and you can just literally say, give it to us and we can just directly go there, you know, that's not that much work. If you need help finding that, or if there's difficulties in retrieving records, then the hours can stack up. And this is how most genealogists and interpreters work. It's kind of based off of how many hours it takes. So there's that. Also, the number of pages you get from a Koseki varies. So my Oya Koseki is only, I think it's like 10 total pages. Um, but I also have a Kikuchi Koseki that I think is closer to 20 or 25 pages. So it depends on your family, how many families you're looking at, that sort of thing. Uh, what resources are available for finding information about uh, Japanese relatives in Latin America? Oh, that's a good one. Um, again, if we're talking U.S. records, a lot of that will be at the National Archives because when, sorry, we're, we're talking about when Latin Americans came to the U.S. because of the war. Uh, this position. person and their grandparents migrated from Japan to Peru, and one of her great uncles was incarcerated by the DOJ during World War II in the U.S. Yeah, so with those, you would look at the DOJ records at NARA. Again, these are probably not going to be online. They're going to be things that you have to actually request from the National Archives, but they should have stuff. Um, and in terms of like records, you know, Peru should have their own records related to your family and their immigration. Again, it's just kind of a language barrier thing and how you access those records there, which I'm not an expert in at all, but yeah. Uh, if other members of my family have trouble getting a Koseki uh, and in the past, would it be worth it to try again now? Uh, um, can Koseki be re requested for names that go far back, i.e. your great-great-grandfather? Yeah, so it's always worth trying again. I mean, and if you want to contact us, you know, we do a 30-minute free consultation. So we can just kind of chat about what the difficulties you had and why you weren't and whether or not we think it would be good to try again. So we can do that. Um, the Koseki system started in like 1850 seven or something like that in the Meiji era. So they only go back that far, but people who were born before that, but were alive in 1850, whatever, will show up in the Koseki. And so you can get information back to people who are about like 1820-ish, sometimes 1800, um, but only because they were alive when the family registry system started. Um. I've heard of people requesting records from the consulate office in Hawaii. 
Do you have any knowledge or experience about what those may offer or how to navigate that process? Yes, that's definitely, if you are lucky enough to have relatives in Hawaii, you can contact the Japanese consulate because they did keep all those records. I haven't actually seen what comes out of those. Um, I think what you would, I believe, I don't know if you have to be able to correspond with them in Japanese or not, but I think you need to know, you would want to know names, dates. If you have the con surname kanji, it would probably be helpful. And if you go to the Japanese consulate, Hawaii's website, I'm sure they have links. Also, JCCH might have some information about that as well, um, since they have worked in some genealogy stuff. My Sansei siblings and cousins are all now in our 60s and late 70s. I want to gather everyone's stories, but I'm finding that maybe because we're old and our memories are bad, our various relatives have different memories and views of the same stories we heard from our Nisei generation. Any suggestions on how to handle that? I think personally, this is just a personal opinion here that I'm going to throw out there. I think it would be interesting to probably the easiest thing is to just sit down, take out your iPhone and record them, each person telling the story from their own perspective and having that. So you have each of their stories or they could write it down. I just find that a lot of people like writing again is time consuming and people don't want to do it. And what you want to do is say, if, if it's about a specific story, say in camp, and this thing happened, like get all the stories and then go do the research yourself. So it could, because likely there will be records that would help prove or disprove that information. We talked to a lot of people who family stories say that their, you know, relative was in this camp for this period, but then they, that ends up not being true, but you can kind of like suss that out by looking at the actual records. Uh, my parents had family tree documents and letters and other stuff in Japanese. Does anyone help translate handwritten, handwritten stuff like that? Yes. And translators usually work at about, it's like 20 to 30 cents per kanji. So you can find translators who will do that. Um, I would say that Densho could help with that. But we all, since we just opened the Koseki Retrieval and Translation Program, it got a lot of response so we're going to be busy for a while but um, if you go to the Linda's webinar on records in Japan has resources for Japanese translators I believe on the handout so you could go check that out. Does Densho have any information on Department of Justice camps specifically Fort Missoula? Um, we Micah, you might be better at answering this. I don't well, know a ton. We have obviously an encyclopedia article about Missoula that covers sort of the broad strokes of the camp. And then if you go into the Dentro Digital Repository and you can search through our topics list, there is a facilities option and you can select everything that's been tagged as Fort Missoula and look through those records there. There's I believe off the top of my head, there should be a handful of photos, maybe some documents from ind other individuals who are incarcerated in those camps and maybe a handful of camp newspapers that we've gotten yeah. over the years. And there's probably oral histories related mm -hmm. to it. If you want to, you can also, you'll also pull up the oral history clips when you do a filtered search. Um, Fort Missoula, there is a museum in Fort Missoula that you could see if they have a website and if they have records and also it as a DOJ camp would be um, with the National Archives. That's where those records would be. I feel like I keep going back to this, but because the incarceration was a government run, whatever you want to call it, project, um, most of the records will be at the National Archives. Uh, we are at noon, Caitlin, and there are still yes. 13 questions. Okay, so... I want to be mindful of everyone's time since it's Sunday and we all have things to do. Um, and like I said, we will follow up with all of you who left questions next week, as long as, I mean, we will, should be able to find your email based off of your name and the registration <laughs> list. Um, so yeah, we will get back in touch with you next week to try and answer your questions. And we're always happy to 
field any other questions you might have. And again, thank you for joining us for the Tadaima 2023 uh, genealogy workshop. And I hope this helped a little bit. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, just a reminder, before you leave, if you have a question or you left it as anonymous, please make sure you put your name in the Q&A. We will not be going through the chat to pull out questions. So please put them into the Q&A before you head out. Yeah, and we'll leave the recording on for just like another minute or two so that you can um, go in and add any questions you have or yeah, move it over from chat. So thank you.